Hi, welcome back to Cosmic and Body Horror. If you enjoy my content, please consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm notices me. Henry Louis Hasse, February 7, 1913, May 20, 1977, was a science fiction writer. His early Cthulhu Mythos story, The Guardian of the Book, appeared in the March 1937 issue of Weird Tales. In this story, he introduced Voril, a planet in the 23rd Nebula. It is claimed that Cthulhu was the offspring of Nug, who mated with Yeb in Voril, the Guardian of the Book by Henry Hasse Weird Tales, March 1937 A strange and curious tale of cosmic horror, of the outer ones from beyond the galaxy, and a soul-shattering experience of stark terror. I am always keeping an eye open for old second-hand bookstores, and as my business takes me to all parts of the city, I have not a few times entered such places to spend an odd half-hour barging among shelves and stacks of musty volumes, often to emerge joyously with some item particular to any one of my several hobbies and interests. On this particular February evening, I was hurrying homeward, and as I crossed a narrow avenue on the outskirts of the wholesale district, I stopped with a pleasurable thrill. A short distance from the corner, I had espied one of those ancient bookstores, one I was sure I had never visited before, a narrow frame storeroom tucked well back between two brick buildings. I had no particular plans for the evening. Already it was growing dark, it was cold, and there was a brisk flurry of snowflakes. I entered the haven which had come to my attention so opportunely. The place was dimly lighted, but I could see that I stood amidst a profusion of books that reposed on shelf and floor alike. There was no one in the front part of the store, but from a rear room came a rattle of pans, so I guessed an evening meal was in progress. Quietly, I browsed around amidst the topsy-turvy miscellany and must have become oblivious to time, for very suddenly there came a little shrill voice close to my ear. There is perhaps some special book? Startled, I spun around. There beside me and peering up into my face was absolutely the strangest little man I had ever seen. To say that he was tiny would be the literal truth, for he couldn't have stood a great deal over four feet. His skin was smooth and tight, and of a color that could only be described as slate gray. Furthermore, his absurd dome of a head was entirely bald, there being not even the slightest vestige of an eyebrow, and in all my life, I had never seen anything half so black as those eyes that stared up into mine as he asked again. There is perhaps some special book. I laughed uneasily. You startled me, I said. Why, no, nothing in particular. Just looking around. Thought maybe I could find something to take home with me this evening. He did not speak. He only made a slight bow and motioned me to go ahead. As I moved amidst the melange of books, I was aware that the little man's eyes followed my every move, and though his expression hadn't changed, I thought he was watching me with something like amusement. My eyes moved over the titles, missing none, for there are certain books I always look for, however remote my chances of ever finding any of them. But now, as I surveyed the books about me, I saw that there was no order of arrangement at all. Fiction, biography, science, history, religion, technical, all were confusedly interspersed. For perhaps five minutes more I searched, before giving it up as a hopeless task, for I hadn't too much time to spend there seeking what I wanted. The little man hadn't moved, and now he was smiling, not unfriendly. I am very much afraid, sir, that you will never find what you are looking for. I had become somewhat impatient, so I said frankly, I agree with you there. I never saw such a mess as this. Oh, I have just moved in here, he explained, still smiling, and have not had much time to arrange things in their proper order. I had surmised as much. I said I would drop in later and started for the door. He placed a hand on my arm. But wait, 
you misconstrued my meaning when I said you would never find what you are looking for. I was not referring to the disarrangement of my books. I merely raised my eyebrows, and he went on, I hope you won't be too astonished, Dr. Wycherley, when I assure you that I am quite aware that there are certain remote books you would give much to own, or even to read. Are there not? And remote as these books are, remote as your chances are, you do nevertheless entertain a hope that perhaps some day, by some lucky chance, you might come into possession of one of them. Is it not true? In my amazement, I answered both his questions at once, hardly knowing that I spoke. Why, yes, indeed yes. His bald head bobbed benignly, and he waved toward the haphazard piles of books around us. And these? He emphasized in that shrill voice. These? They are rubbish. They are nothing. You will not find there what you seek. I was astonished at his vehemence. Probably not, I murmured vaguely. But you, just now, you mentioned my name, and I was not aware that you knew me. Would you mind explaining? Ah, yes. You are puzzled, of course. You are wondering how I came to know your name. That, sir, is entirely inconsequential. Even more so, do you wonder how I could possibly know of that secret desire of yours? The desire to peruse those so-called forbidden books, which speak of the unthinkable things of evil, the books which are, now, so inaccessible as to be indeed forbidden. Suffice it to say, for the present, that I cannot help but know of your delvings into subjects of the weird and terrible, because... Well, because it is most imperative to me that I should know. Therefore, I know. But I think you will agree that your quest for such books is a rather hopeless one. The various versions of Alhazard's Necronomicon, Flammarion's Atmosphere, Von Junst's Nameless Cults, Kane's Magic and Black Arts, Ibon's Book, and The Mysterious King in Yellow, which, if it does indeed exist, must transcend them all. None of these will you find lying around in bookstores. Even those few that are known to be in existence are under lock and key. Of course there are other lesser sources, but even they are not easy to procure. For example, you probably had a difficult time in locating that later edition of the nameless cults which you now have in your possession, and criminally expurgated as it is, I imagine you find it very unsatisfactory. Yes, I do. I admitted breathlessly. I was surprised to have come across a person possessed of such evident familiarity with this rich church literature. The nameless cults which I have, I went on to explain, is the comparatively recent 1909 edition, and it is puerile in the extreme. I should like very much to get hold of one of the originals, published in Germany, believe, in the early 1800s. But he waved that peremptorily aside. What of the Necronomicon, he said, that most fearsome and most hinted at of all the forbidden books? You would give much for a glimpse into that. That, I smiled, is even beyond my fondest hope, and if I were to tell you that I have here in this very shop the original Necronomicon, I did not bat an eyelash. You haven't, I stated positively. He looked not at me but beyond me. True, I have not, he said at last. I thought you would consider that statement an absurdity. He sighed, then went on a bit hurriedly. And yet I wonder if you can imagine an even greater absurdity, a book even more terrible than the dreaded Necronomicon, a book so ominous in its scope as to make the Necronomicon seem as tame as... as... as a cookbook, I supplied jocularly, for the tiny man had become almost amusingly solemn and serious now. Yes a book that tells of things the mad Arab never dreamed of in his wildest nightmares. Indeed, a book not even of this earth, a book that goes back to the very beginning and beyond the beginning. That comes from the very minds of the things that caused all things. I looked at him with a sudden suspicion, then smiled cynically. Are you trying to tell me that you do not have the Necronomicon, but you do have such a book as you describe? His eyes held mine for a moment, and just for that moment there was a gleam in them. Do you dare to let me show you? He asked. Yes, do show me by all means, I replied. Very well. 
Please wait here a moment. I waited, doubtfully enough, and for the first time mused upon the really extraordinary aspect of the thing. I suddenly remembered a story I had read a while back, something about a man who had entered an old bookshop and was plunged into an orbit of strange adventures, something to do with vampires. I was disturbed that this story should leap to my mind at this particular time, but I smiled at the thought of anything untoward happening to me. This little slate-coloured man was a quite peculiar person indeed, but he did not conform to my conception of a vampire. He returned just then, bearing an immense book nearly half as big as he was. You must understand, he said, that what I am going to tell you should not be taken as scepticism. It is important that you should know certain things about this book. He hugged it tightly to him. That will seem to you incredible. First, you should be informed that it does not belong to me, nor to anyone on this earth either. That is the first incredible thing you must believe. If I were to tell you truly to whom it belongs, I would have to say, to the cosmos, and to all ages that were, and are, and will yet be. It is the most damnable book in the universe, and but for it, I but know, I will not tell you that now. I will only say now that I am the guardian of it, the present guardian, and you could never imagine what terrible transits of time and space I have made. Can you blame me for edging toward the door? Can you blame me for wanting to get away from there? There had been a growing suspicion in my mind that this man was mad, and now I knew it. But I said, precisely because I didn't know what else to say, and you want to sell me this book? He peered at me more intently. It could not be bought for all the wealth of this or any other planet. No, I merely want you to read it. I am most anxious that you read it. You may take it home with you if you wish. You see, I am aware that in spite of your scepticism, you are consumed with curiosity. He was right. And yet why did I hesitate? There was something very queer about all this, something that did not appear on the surface, something subtle and almost frightening. So far, he had hinted at much, but had told me exactly nothing. He was far too ready to let me take this book away with me, and something told me that if he were so anxious to have me read it, I would do best by not doing so. No, thanks, I muttered, and didn't try to conceal a shiver as I turned away. I had had enough. His eyes were too black, but he had seemed to anticipate my refusal, and at the door he again gripped my arm. You may as well know, he said, that if you had not come here I would sooner or later have brought the book to you. Knowing what I do know of you and your occult studies, it follows that you are the logical one to be entrusted with this volume. I realize that I have only hinted at things and have told you nothing, but I cannot do more than that now. You must read the book, then you will understand. My hand on the door, I hesitated one fateful moment. In that moment, the book came from under his arm, and he pressed it upon me most eagerly, half shoving me out the door into the dusk of the approaching night. There I stood with that ponderous volume in my hands, mystified, half angry, yet daring to hope that at last I was in possession of something momentous. With a half laugh and a shrug, I turned homeward. Chapter 2 My hopes were more than confirmed, as I soon ascertained in the privacy of my rooms. The book was huge, the size of a large ledger, and very thick, the covers edged all around with metal. The binding was of a black faded fabric unfamiliar to me, and the yellowed pages proved also to be of some strange, resilient texture. The pages were covered with strange, angular symbols, long and narrow and strictly perpendicular. I looked for a key word or key symbol, but there was none, so I stared at the pages, wondering how I was to decipher them and then a strange thing happened, which was to be only the first of many strange events that evening. As I stared, and continued to stare at those bewildering pages, I thought I saw one of the symbols move, ever so slightly. And as I peered intently at the page, it became apparent that the symbols did indeed move, as my eyes ran across the lines, 
rearranging themselves ever so minutely, writhing and twisting like so many tiny snakes. And with this queer writhing movement, I no longer wondered at the meaning of those symbols, for they became suddenly clear and vivid and meaningful, impressing themselves upon my consciousness as so many words and sentences. I knew that I had indeed stumbled upon something very great. The book seemed to exude an invisible aura of evil which at first unnerved me and then pleased me, and I determined to lose no time in plunging into my task. Seated at one end of a library table, I spread the book before me and pulled a lamp nearer. So, comforted by a blazing log fire at my right, I turned to the very first page and began the most fantastic, I might almost say insane, document I have ever read. Yet in consequence of what happened, I can never be sure whether it was the document or I who was insane. But here it is, almost word for word as I so clearly remember it. Preface To the most damnable book ever loosed upon an unsuspecting cosmos. Whoso comes in possession of this book should be warned, and this preface is to serve that purpose. The possessor of this book should be wise to flee from it, but will not. His curiosity is already aroused, and reading even these few words of warning, he will not be deterred from reading on, and reading on, he will be enmeshed, become a part of the plot, and will learn too late that there is left but a single sorrowful alternative of escape. Such is the awful damnability of it, but how they must chuckle with glee. Know then, whoso should read this, that I, Clavier of Voral, do hereby subscribe the history and origin of the book, so that all manner of men in all time to come may consider carefully before succumbing to the curiosity that is inherent in all men throughout the universe. I had no such warning, and by reason of my folly am fated to be the first guardian. I myself know not, yet, what that may portend, for, Try as I might, I cannot forget my friend Cathulan, who all unknowingly launched this horrible jest of the gods, and the fate that was his. Cathulan had always been something of a puzzle to all who knew him except, perhaps to me, even as a boy. He had professed an insatiable wonderment of those profound mysteries of time and space which the wise men of Voral said were not for mere man to know or to seek out. Cathulan could not understand why this should be. We grew up together and entered the university together. There Cathulan became such an avid student of the sciences, particularly complex mathematics, that he was a perpetual astonishment to the professors. We left the university together, I to enter into my father's business, and Cathulan, having been awarded an assistant professorship, to continue with certain of his studies. I can never understand why he confided in me as he would in no one else, unless it was because I listened to his theories with true seriousness. I was fascinated by certain of his lines of thought. Nevertheless, I cannot but admit that he sounded rather wild at times. Here we are, he would say vibrantly, tiny motes upon the surface of the planet Vol, deep in the twenty-third nebula. The great scientists have told us that much as to our present locality. But what of our destination, the ultimate? Here we have our spinning planet, our revolving system, our drifting nebula, but one among millions that go to make what we call the universe. A universe, we should say, for it is only a particle, rushing onward with other particles. Whither? And to what destiny? And for what purpose? For whose purpose, perhaps we should say? And are we never to know? Must we remain ever chained to this miserable little planet? I think not, Telavier. Man in a million years may master the stars, but that will not come in my time, and I cannot wait, and besides, my greed is greater than mere mastery of stars. Look, Telavier, suppose that one could discover a way to project himself out, not among the stars, but beyond, outside of the cosmic globe of stars to attain a point entirely outside, from there to watch the working of the cosmic dust in the fluid of time. Why, there is no time after all, is there? Must not space and time be one and the same thing, coexistent and correlative, one to the other? 
do you not see, and to project oneself quite outside of it, would not that be the realization of our vaunted immortality? And rest assured, there is a way. I could not quite digest this fantastic bit of reasoning, but did not deny the possible truth of his theories. There were several old books to which he often made reference, and I think it was these books that caused his theorizing at times to take a somewhat tangential trend. What of those superstitions, Clavier, that have come down to us from the ancients who inhabited Voral eons ago? And why must we say superstitions and myths? Why must man scoff at that which he cannot understand? It is only logical that these superstitions and myths had a definite reason for being. My perusal of certain ancient manuscripts has convinced me of that. Who knows? Perhaps probing fingers from outside reached in and touched Voral ages ago, thus giving rise to those tales that we know very well could not have had birth in mere imagination. That, Clavier, is why I sometimes think I may be wrong in seeking the way outside. Perhaps it were best for man not to try. He might learn things that it is best not to know. But these latter reflections of his came only seldom. More often, he would show me sheafs of paper covered with calculations, and others filled with geometrical drawings, infinite angles and curves, such as I had never before seen, some of which seemed so diabolically distorted as to leap from the paper out at me. When he would try to explain his calculus, I was never quite able to follow his reasoning beyond a certain point, although his explanation plus his enthusiasm made it all seem quite logical. So far as I was able to grasp it, there exists an almost infinite number of space dimensions, some of which impinge on our own and might be used as catapults if one could but penetrate the invisible and tenuous boundary between our space and these hyperspaces. I had never given much credence to any dimensions beyond our familiar three, but Catalan seemed very certain. There must be a way, Clavier. I have ascertained that beyond doubt and I am sure now that I am working toward the correct solution. I shall find it before long. I, he found it, he found it indeed, and went further than any mortal has ever gone or will ever go again. He could not have known. It was but shortly after my last conversation with him that he disappeared, without trace or reason, was given up as dead, and even I, to whom he had confided all his hopes, did not suspect that I was ever to see him again. But I did. It was twenty long years later when Catholin returned as suddenly as he had gone. He came direct to me. The marvel of it is that he looked not a day older than when I had last seen him those twenty long years ago. But the years had lain heavily on me, and Catholin seemed shocked at the change. He told me his story. I succeeded, Clavier. I knew I was on the right track with my calculus, but it might have gone for naught had I not interpreted a certain passage from one of those ancient books. It was a sort of incantation, the very essence of evil, which opened the door when spoken in correlation with my dimension calculus. The purport of this incantation I cannot tell you now, but it should have warned me that the thing I was doing was for no good. Nevertheless, I dared. I had already gone too far to turn back. I carried the thing through, feeling a little foolish perhaps, only hoping but not knowing that this was the combination I had so long sought for. For a moment it seemed that nothing had happened, and yet I was aware of a change. Something had happened to my vision. Things were blurred but were rapidly emerging into a clear grotesquery of impossible angles and planes. But before this vision could become quite definite, I was jerked outward to Livia, out beyond the curvature of space, out into the space beyond space where even light turns back upon itself because of the non-existence of time. All things ceased, sight and sound, time and dimension and comparison. There was left to me only an awareness, but an awareness infinitely more acute than our mere physical one. I, I was mind, as to them, now I know, Clavier and it is even as I feared. They are not to be imagined as beings or things or anything familiar to us. No word is adequate. They are forces of pure evil, the source of all the evil that ever was, 
and is and will be. Sometimes they reach in. There is a purpose. Cthulhu's hand brushed his forehead. There is much, so very much, Tlavier. All is not as clear as it was. But I am beginning to remember. I am beginning. I think those entities of evil were amused, Tlavier, with a kind of amusement I cannot now understand. Amused, perhaps, that I should have managed to come out there among them. Assuredly no mere being had ever done that before. I realize now that had they wished, they could have uttered a word that would have blasted and annihilated me. Had they wished, instead, they kept me among them. There was something, something about their amusement. Do you remember a certain conversation of long ago, Clavier, wherein I said that our universe was but a particle among other particles, rushing away somewhere, onto some destiny for some purpose? Do you remember also that I said perhaps it was best that man should not know certain things? I have learned many things, Tlavia, things that I now wish I did not know. Monstrous things, whence the cosmos came, and why and its ultimate destiny, not a pleasant one. Most horrible of all is that I am beginning to remember rites performed by those evil ones, rites involving the cosmos in a most diabolic way. I could not even wonder at my presence out there. All was mind, and mind was all. It would seem that I was large among them, willingly one of them, assisting in certain of those colossal rites, partaking of their evil joy. But at one and the same time, by some unexplainable and inconceivable ultra-circumstance, it seemed that I was aloof and insignificant, a spectator of only some small part of the whole, it seemed that I mingled there among them for countless millenniums, but again it seemed but the smallest fraction of what we call time. But now, now I know that they merely toyed with me a while, as a child toys with and then tires of a new plaything. They thrust me back, Clavier, and here I am upon Voril again. At first I thought I had awakened from a very bad dream but it didn't take me long to discover that Vorl had travelled twenty years upon its destined path during those many millenniums, or those few seconds, that I was in that timeless place. And you will go back again? I asked eagerly, for by his very sincerity I believed his story. I cannot, even if I would, nor can any mortal again. They have closed the route now for all time, and it is well so. To them, as I have said, I was but a moment's amusement, but not too insignificant for all that, because they gave me warning. They thrust me back, and this was the warning. If ever I made known to another mortal the slightest of the secrets I had learned, or mentioned any part or purpose of the awful rites I had seen enacted, my soul would be shattered into a million fragments, and these tortured fragments scattered shrieking throughout the entire cosmos. That is why, Tlavier, I dare not tell you more than I have. More and more memory floods in upon me, but I dare not speak of things. Because I know that they can reach in. From that day neither Catholin nor I again mentioned his sojourn outside. For a long time I could not forget the things he had hinted at, but how terrible must have been that which he did not, dared not, tell. Several years passed, and the whole thing became more or less a myth in my mind, but not so with Catholin, it was easy to see. The twenty years that had ignored him now reached out malign fingers and took their toll. Vexation, discontent, restless broodings of the mind, all served to change him pitiably. He came to me then, one day, and broached the thought that had been preying upon him. He could not, he said, remain silent longer. He was sick of the blind groping of men after knowledge. It lay in his power to give them the answers to cosmic secrets which they had sought out slowly for years, and things besides, of which they had never guessed. And terrible though those secrets were, man should know all. Thoughts and memories crowding upon Catholin's tortured brain screamed for outlet, and there was but one resource. He had determined to write down the history of his adventure outside, to tell of all the things he had experienced and learned. As to the warning which the entities of evil had given him, 
it was nothing. Years had gone by, Catholin reasoned, and surely they must have forgotten. We were puny, and they reckoned with universes. I did not demur. Like Catholin, now that the years had passed, I felt that the warning of those outer ones was a little thing. Thus was the beginning of the jest. Never can I forget that night when doom descended upon the city of Buum. I had left the city but a few hours before, accompanying one of my caravans into the neighboring town, access to which led through a tortuous passage in the encircling mountain range. The passage was made without mishap, and my business transacted. I was hurrying homeward, alone, and was well into the mountains when that strange darkness descended so mysteriously and prematurely. Shortly thereafter I saw the long, livid streamer that came flickering out of space. To hesitate a moment and then dart out of sight directly behind the range ahead of me. I spurred hurriedly forward, already with a feeling of disaster, when I finally pushed through the passage and came in sight of the city. The streamer was gone, and everything was quiet with a stillness that seemed to shriek in agony to the pale stars peering fearfully down. I entered the city and came upon a person groveling in the street, and when I bent to help him, he seemed not to see me but shrieked over and over again. Something about the shape that had come slithering down the streamer. He lapsed then into a drooling insanity, and I left him lying there and passed on into the heart of the city. It was not long before full, unhallowed horror burst upon me. The entire populace had been rendered not only gibberingly insane but stark blind. Some lay quite still in the streets, in merciful oblivion, some still writhed and mouthed unintelligibly of the thing that had descended to blast their minds and their sight, and others groped pitifully about, dazed and whimpering. I rushed to the house of my friend Cathuon, but already I knew I was too late. I found what I had expected. He was dead, but his body, as I gazed on it, was scarcely recognizable as the one I had known. It was entirely covered with tiny blue perforations, gruesomely suggestive. His limbs were horribly distorted and broken. His eyes had been torn from their sockets, and two great holes gaped in his face from which something oozed. And his lips were drawn back in such a frozen, exaggerated grin that I turned quickly away. Scattered about in profusion were loose pages upon which I recognized my friend's fine writing. Well, did I know what that writing was and what it portended? and in a sudden insane frenzy I gathered them all up, stuffed them into my clothes, and fled from there in precipitate horror. I crossed the three great oceans of Vol, and after many mishaps reached the abhorred continent of Dluag. I ascended the tortuous inner mountains and descended into the lowlands fraught with those creatures supposed to have passed from the face of Vol eons ago. Slowly, relentlessly, I thrust my perilous way forward and finally, half dead from hurt and fatigue, reached my objective. The half-mythical city of a mysterious and fanatical priest-like sect, so secluded that only the various rumors of its existence ever reached the outer realms of Voral. I was taken in, and my wounds were ministered to, for all are welcomed, and none are questioned who managed to reach there. So it was that in the quietude of my temporary quarters in that deep, hidden city, I dared finally to delve into the secret linings of my clothes and bring out those pages which Cathulin had written before doom descended upon him. Arranging them in their sequence, I saw that Cathulin had been allowed to finish his treatise, and somehow this fact was more profoundly disturbing than if he had been suddenly cut off before he could finish. Tremulously, I began to read, and was immediately absorbed. But before long, I encountered Cthulhu's first few hints of the cosmic horrors to be revealed, and I began to waver. I read on. A few more pages. I became appalled and frightened. I lost heart then, would have ceased reading, would have destroyed those pages for all time, but found to my unutterable horror that I could not. A will that was not my own compelled me to read on. All things around me ceased to exist. I was no longer bound to Voral, but was drawn, sensually if not bodily, 
into the very midst of those mad pages. Far into the night and into the morning hours, mind reeling, soul recoiling, I perused those all-revealing pages which moved relentlessly but surely toward a final, culminating immensity which froze my brain. A sullen dawn was looming when I finished that terrible treatise and screamed curses upon all the gods that were. For then I knew. Fool, fool that I was. Fool to have thought that the tiny globe of Voral, or the entire cosmic sphere itself, could contain any place of hiding from them. Fool not to have destroyed those pages utterly unread. But it was too late. The eternal dirge of all mankind. Too late. I had succumbed to that deadly and avaricious arch-enemy, curiosity. I had read, and was utterly and damnably doomed. And now, as if in answer to my imprecations, there came a mocking chuckle of amusement as if from far away, and then nearer, riding down the star wind. Faint and clear, a peculiar sibilance and a shifting as if every individual atom in the planet of Vol had been deviated infinitesimally from its path, dot intense, cold, a kind of livid glare that burst suddenly, filling all the room about me. And then, I think I tried to shriek, but each succeeding attempt rose to a certain point in my throat and stopped. How can I convey the soul-shattering horror of that moment, when, from the nothingness before me, there emerged a thing, a sort of shapeless, writhing mass, greenish and fluorescent, tangible and sentient, indescribable, because it was constantly changing, fading away at the edges as if it were but a projection reaching through from some other space or dimension. In that moment, I remembered those words Cuthulan had said to me, because I know, Tlavia, that they can reach in, in that moment. I knew what manner of thing confronted me, knew that this was the shape that had descended upon the city of Boom those many months ago, to blast all intelligence. I knew that I must shriek to save my mind, tried again and again, but could not. And then as I closed my eyes against the blinding brilliance of it, and felt my mind slipping slowly away, there seemed to emanate from the thing a radiance to touch my brain with a soothing coolness. The first icy wave of horror passed over me and left me calm with that utter impassivity born of hopelessness. So it was that there, in the cold dawn of that nameless city, I listened to the pronouncement of the doom that was to be mine. I say listened, but there was no sound. The thing was polychromatic, with an interplay of colors many of which I was certain were alien to this universe. And with every scintillating change of color, thought was sent pulsing into my brain. The fate reserved for me, the thing scintillated, was not to be as Cthulhu's, nor as those other unfortunates back in the city of Boom, for I was the very keynote upon which they based their jest. Not until the person whom I knew as Cthulhu had found the way out there had they ever so much as suspected the existence of such animalia on the tiny spheres. Observing closely, then, they discovered that many of the spheres abounded with such creatures, and they were amused at the colossal impudence of this one. Probing Cthulhu's mind, they discovered that it was his inherent curiosity which had made him seek for the answers to galactic secrets and finally to find the way out there. This phenomenon of curiosity or aspiration, they discovered, was a universally inherent quality of these animalia. Furthermore, it was a quality of good to which they, being forces of pure evil, were opposed. Then it was that they conceived their jest. They thrust Cathalon back upon Vol with that dire warning which he had almost whispered to me. To them, who were timeless and therefore omnipresent, the phenomena which Cathalon knew as past and future were as one. They had foreseen that Cathalon would not heed that warning. And the thing went on, knowing well the fate that had been his, I had had every opportunity to destroy those pages he had written, but it was foreseen, indeed foreordained, that I should read, and now those pages would never be destroyed. I would bind them well, into a book that would be imperishable all through the ages, and upon that book they would cast a curse to await any who dared to peruse it. And as a stimulant to this gigantic scheme of the outer ones, conceived by them for their own amusement, 
I must preface the book with a warning to all mankind. Then let him disregard the warning who dared. Reading on, there could be no turning back. He would be compelled to read on to the end, and upon him would devolve the curse. Only when such a one had dared would I be free. As to the curse, the thing continued, and my immediate fate, he was undetermined. Perhaps he would take me out there. Such things as aspiration and emotion and mind in connection with the tiny motes they had newly discovered on the spheres had aroused a transient interest, and experiments would be entertaining. Such diabolism only those entities could conceive. The thing has gone now, as I, Clavier, conclude this preface of warning, but I feel that I have written these words under a pervading surveillance. From infinitely far away now, I seem to hear unleashed shouts of glee, or is that only my imagination? But no, very close to my ear now, as I write these final words, comes that penetrant and portentous chuckle which I know is not imagination, to remind me that this which I write, everything all, is but a part of their preconceived plan. Chapter 3 The book lay there, opened wide, flat on the table before me. Thus had the preface ended, on the left-hand page, the page opposite it was blank, and there were many pages following. For a long time I sat there in the absolute stillness of the room, pondering, full of amazement at what I had just read, wondering what evil secrets might be revealed in those following pages. Even the things hinted at in the preface were suggestive enough. I recalled with a start how anxious that tiny slate-coloured man had been for me to read the book, and I wondered if, indeed, the curse would be transferred to me if I dared to turn the page and read on. Abruptly, I came to my senses with a little laugh. Nonsense, I said aloud to the room. What am I thinking of? Such things as that can't be. My hand reached out to turn the page. The log in the fireplace snapped sharply. I arose to replenish the fire, noticing as I did so that the clock on the mantel said twenty minutes until midnight. For the first time, I was aware of the chill that had crept into the room. As I turned from my task, I saw that tiny man of the bookstore standing very quietly there beside the table. Now by all rules of propriety, I should have been shocked or astounded or scared. Later I wondered why I hadn't been, but right then, I wasn't any of those things. I should at least have done him the courtesy of inquiring how he had learned my address, or how he had managed to enter my room, the very solid door of which I had most decidedly locked. But right then as I turned and faced him, I only seemed to think how very appropriate this all was, that he should be there, so very opportunely. There were several of the most deucedly puzzling points about the book that I should like to clear up. Oh, I knew, of course, that all this was nothing but a dream, knew that that was why it was so illogical. The little man spoke first, in answer, as it were, to the very first question I had been about to ask. No, I am not that Talavia whose warning you have just read, he said with a monotony that suggested an infinite weariness of repetition. The fact is, we may never know how many eons ago this diabolic thing began, that very part of the cosmos where the book had its origin may long since have passed into oblivion. But, for all of that, neither am I of your world. It was ages ago on my own planet, the very location of which I have long forgotten, that the book came to me in much the same way it has come to you, brought to me by a queer person not of my own planet, who had traversed the ages in the outer spaces with the book. I was an avid student of the vaguely hinted at prim and dane creatures supposed to have inhabited my world before it swam into light out of the darkness. Just as you have read, so did I read, eagerly. And just as you now doubt, appalled at the thought of the immensity that might be, so did I doubt, as you now hesitate before the book. So did I hesitate, but in the end, I gestured impatiently at the thought he was trying to suggest to me. Whatever kind of hoax this was, it was silly. True, I had always been an imaginative person, my library consisting of the weirdest literature ever written, 
but always deep in my mind was the safe and comfortable knowledge that it was literature and nothing more. But now, to ask me to believe that upon this book had been placed a curse, to be transferred to him who read, that it had come here through space and through the ages from some alien planet, brought here by this man who claimed he was not of this world, that was too much. It was much too much. That is the stuff of which fiction is made. So thinking, I once more reached out toward the book. But, thank God, my hand recoiled in horror as those queer writhing symbols upon the open page met my eye with a significance that jerked my mind back to a semblance of reason. For I saw that those symbols were not, could not be of this earth. I felt myself suddenly trembling as all my assurance vanished in an instant, trembling as my taut mind suddenly sensed things lurking, out of sight and sound, but very near. The tiny man had watched my movements with an intense expectancy and eagerness, and as my hand recoiled his whole being bespoke disappointment and temporary defeat. But this was only for an instant, and then he too seemed to sense some invisible presence close at hand stood poised, very still, head erect as if listening to something that I could not hear, something I was not meant to hear. For just a moment he stood thus before he spoke again, and now his voice, as he went on, was weary once more and sad. Yes, you had persisted in believing that all of this was some kind of hoax, but now, even as all the others, you know differently. You delight in delving into the weird and terrible, and I had hoped that you would be the one. But it has always been thus. On the outermost planet of your system, that which you call Pluto, I encountered a denizen who, like yourself, was intensely interested in the ancient and dreadful superstitions of his planet. He also read the preface that you have just read. He too wavered with that dread uncertainty, but his courage failed him, and he fled from me and the book as he would have fled from a plague. And so I knew that once again I had failed in this grotesquerie, that not yet was I to be free from the curse. But it has been so long, and nowhere can I escape those tortures of mind and soul which they inflict upon me at their will, for it is from them that I derive the immunity to the terrors of outer space, and that hitherto unsuspected power of darkness which transcends by far the power of light by which I am enabled to traverse the space between planets and between galaxies. But no single moment, no single thought of my own. You cannot know the horror of that. Sometimes in the middle of night they project a blasphemous shape upon me, whose toothless mouth opens and closes in an obscene, soundless sound, who sits on my chest to perform a grotesque rite during which my very identity is lost in the churning of chaotic confusion and my mind reels out amidst the booming monody of the stars, on out into that boundless abyss beyond the outermost curved rim of cosmic space, where they dwell in contemplation of a monstrous catastrophe to the cosmos. Nay, it is more than a contemplation, the thing has begun, is being done now, and out there I have assisted in this thing, the very immensity of which would drive one mad who knew. I would welcome madness, but they will not even let me go mad. His voice, ordinarily thin and shrill, had reached a penetrating shriek. But, I said at last in a sort of triumph, if you are so anxious for me to read this book, these very things you tell me defeat your purpose. If this whole crazy thing is not a dream, which I believe it is, he almost reeled as he put his hand to his head. That is because you do not know the malign cunning of them who conceived this plot. My very thoughts, the words I speak, come from them. I am theirs. An almost imperceptible pause during which he again seemed to listen to that which I could not hear. And he continued, But consider well. The book reveals secrets which can be yours, knowledge of which you have scarcely dared to dream. Why? You have not even thought to connect that Cthulhu mentioned in the preface with that tentacled and ever-damned Kulu, reputed to have come to Earth eons ago by way of the planet Saturn, to which it had previously fled. From depths beyond your solar system, you can know whence obscure and loathsome Tsothogwa came, and why, 
and other obscenities of subhuman legend hinted at in your Necronomicon and other forbidden books, Nyarlat Hotep and Hastar and the abominable Mago, frightful and omniscient Yog Sothoth, ponderous and proboscidian Chang Darfon, and Beelzebub the Devourer. You will converse with the Whisperer in darkness, you will know the meaning of the affair that shambleth in the stars, and will behold the hunters from beyond. You will learn the very source of those hounds of Tindalos who dwell in a chaotic nebular universe at the very rim of space, and who are in league with those outer ones. All of these things, with which you are vaguely familiar through your readings, will you know, and much more. In the pages of the book, which go beyond the very beginning, are revealed secrets which the wildest flights of your imagination cannot begin to comprehend. Your mind, now such a puny thing, will expand to encompass that entire infinite arcanum of all matter, and you may learn in what manner the entire cosmos was spewed forth by an evil thought in the mind of a monstrous thing in the darkness. You will see that this cosmos which we consider infinite is but an atom in their infinity and you will behold the appalling position of our cosmos in that larger infinity, and the obscene rites in which it plays an integral part. You will know the histories of suns and nebulae, and yours will be the power of bodily transposition between planets, or even to galaxies so remote that their light has not yet reached Earth. How can I describe those few minutes, his shrill voice going relentlessly on, the book lying open there on the table between us. The flames in the fireplace, throwing flickering shadows about the room, I standing there stiffly erect, one hand on the table, mind reeling, trying to grasp the great magnitude of these things he was telling me and trying to weigh, one against the other, what I dared to believe and what I feared to believe. And all the time he was speaking, his head was held in that position which made me think he was listening, Listening. For what? His gaze as he talked was not fixed on me, but over my shoulder at the mantel where rested the clock. Once, while he was speaking, I had slid my hand forward on the table, slowly to almost touch the book, but an almost imperceptible change in the timbre of his voice made me draw my hand back. And all during his rambling sentences, whether it was the bewildering effect of his words on my brain or not, I shall never know. I seem to sense more and more clearly the presence of those invisible forces lurking nearby, and they, too, seem to be waiting. He was no longer speaking. I was not aware of when exactly he had stopped speaking. I only knew that I was no longer listening to his voice, but was listening for something else. Something, I knew not what. I only knew that we were not alone in that room, and that the time had not yet come but was near. So I listened for that which I could not quite hear and stared again, fascinated, at the book that lay there on the table between us. He saw that fascination. Red, he whispered fervently, bending toward me. You know you want to read. You want to read. Yes, I wanted to read. More and more was that fact forcing itself upon me. What sane man could believe that this book had such menacing connections as he had hinted? but I was past being sure that I was a sane man. If I believed this story, I was assuredly not sane. If I did not believe, why did I hesitate? Again his whisper, You want to read. His almost imploring tone caused me to recoil from the book in horror. But the fascination had not left me, and I could not utter the emphatic, No, that had risen to my tongue. Instead, I looked quickly, a little wildly, about the room, into the corners, anywhere except into that little man's eyes, for I suddenly knew that to do so would be fatal. Those unseen forces seemed to fill the room now. I could feel a definite tumult, a sort of surging to and fro, faint sounds of fury as of a mounting hostility between two opposing groups, a growing but unseen confusion of which I was the centre. Into my mind flashed the thought that there was no little grey man, and no book, and that all the seeming events of the evening were but a nightmare from which I would presently awaken. But no, 
Here I was, standing in my library beside the table with that absurd little man opposite me, and that growing, unseen tumult about me. Could one think thus in nightmares, I wondered? Probably not, and therefore this was no nightmare. Close upon this illogical chain of thought came another, with a suddenness so terrifying that I knew it had not originated in my own mind. It was one of those thoughts out of nowhere. It was simply the plain and uncompromising knowledge that this was all real, no hoax, no farce, but that I was faced with the most stupendous thing that had ever come to this earth and must conquer it or be conquered. I knew too with a sudden wild hope that I would not be alone in fighting it. Those forces surging ever closer about me were there for a purpose, presaged something in my favour. I turned then with a slow, deliberate ness and faced the tiny man who was waiting. No word was spoken as my eyes met his very black and bottomless ones. I was lost. Too late I knew it. Everything around me vanished as those eyes grew, expanded, became two huge pools of space black and boundless beyond all imagining. I had been caught by the suddenness of it, but with a feeble instinct I fought against those eyes which seemed to draw me. But there were no longer any eyes. My feet were no longer on the floor. I was floating serenely along somewhere a million miles out in that black space. Serenely. But no, I was no longer floating now. A touch had brought me back. My feet were on the floor again, and I stood close against the table. But something, some part of me, seemed still to move along against my own volition. That was funny. I wanted to laugh. It was my hand that was no longer a part of me, that was creeping, crawling, sliding like some sinuous serpent across the smooth tabletop. Toward the book. Yes, I remembered then, in a vague sort of way. There was a book on the table, a book that lay open and waiting, a book that for some terrible reason I must not touch. What was that reason? Slowly, Slowly I remembered. There was a queer little man with very black eyes who had told me an awful fact about the book, who had wanted me to read. To touch it would mean that I should read, and read, no turning back. Ah, how fully did comprehension then flee back to me, through my rising panic, as I sought in vain to stay the hand that crept along the table there like some Judas that would betray its master. How that churning confusion about me did increase, warningly, sweeping around me in an undulating wave as if they too knew something of the panic that was upon me, how they closed in around me, those unseen forces, from behind, from all sides, purposeful, as if they would press me back away from the table, away from the menace of the book. I almost heard tiny warning voices flitting past my ear, almost felt fingers tugging valiantly at my own, and for a moment I thought I comprehended. These forces, rallying valiantly about me, had they once succumbed to the book in ages past, countless beings from all parts of the universe, come now to ally themselves with me against the forces of the book? I may have guessed close to the truth. I shall never know, nor shall I ever know by what terrific effort I finally hurled myself away from that table. I do not remember it. I only know that I stood at last supporting myself on the back of my chair, trembling in body and weak in mind, knew that the tension of that terrible moment was gone, and that the forces which had rallied around me were once again quiet, waiting. That this was but a temporary respite in the battle I well knew, and knew too that my exhausted brain could not endure another such assault. A half dozen feet away the book lay face up on the table, a menacing, mocking thing. Opposite it, that tiny man still stood on the self-same spot where I had first glimpsed him in the room. In those black eyes was now a luster, a bright luster of hate for those forces which had fought with me against him, those which he must have known would come. How many times had they defeated him, I wondered? Had each of them once been a guardian of the book as he was now? If ever he won release from the book, would he in turn join forces with those who fought against it? Would they ever become strong enough to defeat those outer ones who had conceived this entire plot? I must not waste my strength in wondering, but prepare for the assault that must surely come again. 
In a sudden flash of illumination, I knew that I must hold on, just a little longer, hold on, until twelve o'clock. That's why he had watched the clock there on the mantel, over my shoulder. It must be very near the hour now, and if I could but hold on, stay away from that table, avoid those eyes, not be caught off guard again. But how futile a thought. In that very instant, the huge swimming blackness of those eyes again caught me with that fierce tenacity, again swept me up and away beyond all suns and stars, out into that vast darkness which cradles the universe. I was like a man drowning, who in a few brief seconds sees his entire past unfold, but I saw instead my future, a future of dark terror and torture amid the vague forms and fears of that outer place. Even as I floated serenely in that terrible darkness, I could seem to see those forms, those outer ones, indescribably repulsive for all their vagueness. Peering past me with malicious glee at some drama being enacted for them, as it had been how many times before. And this time, I was a part of that drama. And yet there seemed to be another part of me, far away and unimportant, a part of me that tried to make me see that this darkness was the illusion, not the reality, that struggled with a feeble sort of intensity to thrust this darkness away. How foolish, how useless. Now that other part of me was trying to remember. Something that had seemed important a long time ago. Something to do with. But no, it was useless. Wait, had not that darkness all about me suddenly shivered, like water whose smooth surface is disturbed? Again, now fading, receding, had not something brushed my cheek just then? Was that a whisper in my ear? A number of whispers now, eager, urgent. The blackness around me receded rapidly, dissolved into two ebony pools that fled far away into space, becoming tinier, tinier, until they stopped to peer back at me. With a shock, I was once again back in the familiar room, felt the floor under me, stood close against the table, and was gazing at the twin ebony pools that were the tiny man's eyes. But in those eyes was now something of consternation and distress dismay in those eyes. As before, with no volition of mine, my hand was gliding smoothly across the tabletop toward the book. As before, that surging of unseen forces was all about me. But now there was no confusion, no haste, no panic. There was instead a kind of unseen jubilation and pulsing of triumph. But still those flitting little voices passed my ear, faint and not quite heard, seemed to urge me in something that I could not quite grasp. I must try to be ready for whatever would come. My hand touched the book. It moved over the opened page. Now, act now, act, act. The hand which before had tried to betray me now acted in a flash. I seized the book, whirled and cast it straight into the blazing fire behind me. Immediately everything about me was a wild joy of triumph, but this lasted only a moment and then all was quiet and still. Those forces, or beings, or whatever they were, had once more triumphed, and now were gone back to whatever realm they had come from. But as I look back at it all now, it seems a nightmare, and I cannot be sure. I am not even sure whether those words, Act now, act, were whispered in my ear, or whether they came screaming from my own throat in the tenseness of that moment. I am not sure whether some force entirely outside of myself caused me to seize and fling that book, or whether it was a purely reflex action on my part. I had no intention of doing it. As for that tiny man beyond the table, he did not even leap to intercept. He did not move. He seemed to become even smaller. His eyes were once more very black, but somehow pitiable, not even reflecting the fire into which he gazed. For a few seconds he stood there, the very aspect of infinite sorrow and utter hopelessness. Then, very slowly, he walked over to the fireplace and reached a thin hand, as it seemed to me, into the very flames, and from those flames picked out the book, the age-old parchment-like pages of which had not even burned. Of what happened next, I hesitate to write. 
for I can never be sure how much of it was real and how much hallucination. In my fall to the floor, I must have struck my head a pretty hard wallop, for I was several days in the care of a doctor who for a while feared for my mind. As I said, the tiny man had picked out the book from the flames. I am sure no word was spoken, but the next thing that happened was a sound, and it was a chuckling sound of such portentous diabolism as I hope never to hear again, seeming to come from far away but approaching nearer and nearer until it seemed to emanate from the four walls of the room. Then came a blinding glare of light. That sounds trite somehow, but it was exactly that. Blinding hardly describes it, but I know of no stronger word. And it's at this point that I am not certain. I may have fallen and struck my head and become unconscious right after that glare of light, or I may really have seen what I seem to see. I'm rather inclined to the latter belief, so vivid did it seem at the time. How often I've read stories in which the author, attempting to describe some particularly awful thing or scene, has said, It is beyond the power of my pen to describe, or words to that effect, and how often I have scoffed, but I will never scoff again. There before me in that moment was the indescribable in reality. I will, however, make a feeble attempt. What I saw, or seemed to see, must have been that same thing from outside which Clavier described in the preface of the book. One moment it wasn't there, and the next moment it was there. I suppose the glare of light occurred in that interval between the wasn't and the was. But there it was. I can look back upon it now with a sort of grim humour. It was pretty big and seemed to be sticking through from some other space or dimension, just as the fellow had said in the preface. It wasn't an arm, or a face, or a tentacle, or a limb of any sort, nothing but a part, and I wouldn't want to say what part. It was all colours and colourless, all shapes and shapeless, for the simple reason that it changed colour and shape very rapidly and continually, always disappearing at the edges, not touching the floor or any part of the room. More than that I cannot say. I had looked upon it for barely the count of one, two, three, when everything was suddenly black, and I could not feel the floor under me at all. But just before my mind slipped entirely away into the abyss, I heard a monstrous word, a name shrieked in that shrill voice that belonged to the tiny man with the book, and once again that name shrieked in agony, shrill, faint, floating down along the star path, fainter, fainter. The first thing I did when able to leave my bed was to pay another visit to that bookstore. As I approached the narrow frame building, its air of utter desolation dawned upon me. I tried the door, but it was locked, and peering through a grimy window, I perceived the books piled around haphazardly on the floor and on the shelves, everything covered with a grey depth of dust. That was peculiar. A curious apprehension seized me. I was sure this was the right bookstore. There could be no mistaking it. I had considerable difficulty finding out who the owner was, but I finally located him, a tall, raw-boned, rather unkempt man. Oh, he said, in answer to my question, you mean the place down on Sixth Avenue? Yes, I own the place. Used to run a bookstore there. Business bad, so I locked it up. All of six months ago, I reckon it was. I might make another stab at it sometime. No, I've never unlocked the place here since. Yes, sure. Of course I'm sure. What? A man about four feet tall with grey skin and no eyebrows? Hell, no! He looked at me as though he thought I was crazy, so I didn't pursue the matter further. But I don't think I want to read the Necronomicon after all. End of the Guardian of the Book by Henry Hasse Horror at Vecra by Henry Hasse The Acolyte, Fall 1943 An ancient evil that will not die, but draws men, soul, and brain, the pale stars peering fearfully down. Remember whence it came, the very darkness where they wait, doth shudder at the name. Monstrous and their kinder. 
Now, after 12 years, vague reports are issuing again from the vicinity of Vekra. As yet, they are little more than rumors, but they have served to awaken the remote horror in my brain. Horror, for I now realize I must have failed a dozen years ago when I stood there on that brink of madness for a few hell-filled seconds. I used dynamite then. Enough of it, I thought, and believed that was the end. Now I can only wonder if this is the same evil or some spawn of it that will never die. Perhaps even now it is not too late. I have kept silence, but now I shall tell my story, and if I cannot then enlist aid, I will myself. But lest I become too incoherent, I had best begin on that day a dozen years ago. Bruce Tarleton and I were returned to Boston from a two-week camping trip. Bruce was driving, and before very long I began to suspect that he had taken the wrong fork back at North Eaton, though he maintained a stolid silence as the dirt road became gradually narrower and ruttier. I had a disquieting feeling that it was luring us on and on into this strange New England back country. Our way twisted through gloomy stretches of forest where limbs hung low over the road. They seemed strangely gnarled and misshapen. Queer patches of colorless vegetation pressed in upon us. We crossed narrow wooden bridges whose loose planks rumbled beneath us as the car rolled slowly over them. We dipped into shallow valleys where the evening sunshine seemed oddly depressing and not as bright as it should be. For the most part, these valleys seemed barren and rock-strewn, but after a while we came upon occasional poorly tilled fields and square, ungainly, unpainted farmhouses. These were set upon slopes far back from the road, reminding me of nothing so much as dead things sprawled there in that unhealthy sunshine. Neither of us had spoken much since leaving North Eaton, but I somehow got the impression that Bruce was secretly enjoying all this. At last we rumbled across a rickety wooden bridge, followed the turn of the road to the right, and with startling suddenness found ourselves in a little village. My first impression was one of surprise that it should be there at all. Then, without exactly knowing why, I knew that I loathed the place. I guess this is Vekra, Bruce said, almost to himself. How do you know that? He turned and looked at me queerly. Huh? Why the sign? At the other end of the bridge back there. Didn't you see it? I looked at him suspiciously. No, I hadn't seen it, and I thought that was strange, because for the last twenty miles I'd been watching for some such sign of a town. But I didn't say anything. Instead, I looked about me. Vekra had evidently been at one time a more prosperous town than present indications showed. A score of frame houses lined each side of the road that was the main street, but now most of them were desolate, empty and weather-beaten, long since fallen into a state of sad decay. Only in a scattered few did we see pitiful enough signs of habitation as oil lamps gleamed meagerly in the approaching dusk. Those lamps seemed no more meagre than our own gloomy situation. Apparently the only way out of this forsaken country was back along the road we had travelled, and the prospect of retracing that route at night did not appeal to me. We stopped at what appeared to be the general store to inquire where we might stay overnight. A small, bent, leathery old man shuffled toward us as we entered. I took an immediate dislike to him. Maybe it was his suspicious black eyes that peered from beneath a tangle of dirty white hair. Maybe it was his quaint old dialect and the way he seemed to be secretly enjoying something at our expense. Lost your way, have ye young fellas? I seed ye drive up out there, and I reckoned as how that wore the case. Ain't many outside uns has called to come this away, except in them as takes the wrong rud back at North Eaton. He peered closer at us and chuckled. Them as does, alias comes clear on Tervecra, a cause there ain't no other way they kin come. I glanced nervously at Bruce, but saw that he was listening with intense interest to the old man's archaic speech. After another evil chuckle, he went on. Now, as I wore saying, folks as gits up to Vekra in daylight, most alias goes back to North Eaton, and them as gets up here by dark. They be mostly skeered to travel back afore the morning he leered at us with yellowish bloodshot eyes. Which be ye? 
I guess we'll stay over for the night, I said hurriedly. If there's someone who will be kind enough. Yep. Reckon he be Cory Kin fix he up fur the night. His place be easy to find. The big house down to end o the rud. Tell E. B. Thetla Wilson sent ye. As we went out the door, I looked back and saw the old man still leering at us. Although I couldn't hear him, I imagined he was chuckling evilly again. I don't like him, I said to Bruce. Bruce chuckled, and it didn't sound much better than the old man's. I do. He's certainly a queer old bird. I think I'll come down here tomorrow and have a longer talk with him. We found the Cory place without any trouble. E.B. Cory, a tall, gaunt, slow-speaking man, received us stolidly. However, I imagined his wife was vaguely perturbed. There was something tragic about her, especially in her eyes, as though she had been haunted a long time ago and had never quite forgotten. She served us a plain but substantial meal, and we ate appreciatively. The room was large and appeared to me as definitely nineteenth century, including the smell. It was lighted by only two or three oil lamps, and shadows clung to the far corners. The room seemed full of dozens of children of all sizes, though we learned later there were only five. As their mother sent them upstairs to bed, they peered back at us curiously through the stair banister. Many outsiders up this way? Bruce asked at last, when we had finished the meal. Last was a few months ago, Corey replied. He seemed reluctant to talk. Bruce lit his pipe and blew a wreath of smoke at the ceiling. His next words were so abrupt and inventive they startled even me. I hear you've got some mighty queer land hereabouts. I'm a government soil inspector, sent up from Boston. I gaped at the lie, knowing he was nothing of the kind. But he sent me a silencing look, about land, especially about his land, and most particularly about what was wrong with his land. E.B. Corey was more than willing to talk. For an hour or more they talked, while I smoked cigarettes in silence and listened amazedly to the technical knowledge of soil that Bruce displayed. He was a professor of languages at Boston College, a far cry from an expert in soil conditions. But then I had learned always to expect the unexpected from Bruce Tarleton. Before retiring, we went out to move the car. We came back in time to hear Mrs. Corey remonstrating with her husband. It seemed to have something to do with our sleeping quarters. Corey was shaking his head stubbornly, and Mrs. Corey retired from the argument as we entered. It's that room in the back wing upstairs, Ebe explained, as he led the way up the worn wooden stairs, lamp in hand. There's been some tale about it for more than fifty years. Martha's made me keep it locked lately. My grandfather built this place, added the wing later. Not haunted, is it? Bruce asked with a show of jocularity. I noticed the falseness of his tone, the suppressed excitement, but E. B. Corey did not. Nor, he said, the story's got something to do with a funny kind of dream people sometimes have when they sleep in that room. I don't know what it is. Martha says she does, but she won't talk about it. I slept in there a couple of times, but I never had any dream. That's all right, Bruce said. I don't dream either. I knew a scientific man like you wouldn't put up with such stock. There's only a small cot in there that one of you can use, and then there's another small room across the hall. Sorry, I can't offer you better. I looked about me dubiously as we passed along a narrow hall toward the rear of the old house. The lamplight made a pale, moving pattern on the papered walls that were worn smooth and brown from the contact of generations. I stopped at my door, and Bruce went along to his, which directly faced the length of the hall. Eb unlocked that door and said, I'll be out in the south field tomorrow, Mr. Tarleton. Hope you'll come out and take a look at the soil. I saw Bruce nod, and I waited until Eb Corey made his way expertly back downstairs in the dark. Then I quickly crossed the hall to where Bruce stood with the lamp in his hand. I don't like this at all, I began. What's this business about you being? Come on in here, and I'll tell you. Everywhere in this house I had been aware of that dank, age-old, peculiar odour. I might almost call it a yellow odour. I had smelled it in other old houses, 
but the moment we entered this upstairs room it seemed magnified, became almost tangible. The place seemed half bedroom and half storeroom. One side was piled haphazardly with trunks, boxes, broken tables and chairs. Bruce held the lamp high, looked around, and grinned most delightedly. Already he had espied a tall, clumsy bookcase in the far corner. He strode over to it and examined the faded tomes. Quickly he pulled one out, then another, and another. I groaned. I might have known this. Bruce had had this detour planned all the time. He had come up here deliberately. I sat down on a rickety chair and watched him. Finally I said, All right, what is it this time? And don't give me any more of that Necronomicon stuff, for I know that's a myth. Bruce was an authority on certain terrible laws and forbidden books dealing with such laws, and he had told me things from a certain Necronomicon that literally made my flesh crawl. What? he said in answer to my question. Why look at these, not Necronomicons, but most interesting. He thrust a couple of worn, leather-bound volumes into my hands. I glanced at the titles. One was Horride Mysteries by the Marquis of Grosset, the other Nemedian Chronicles. I looked up at Bruce and saw that he was genuinely excited. Do you mean to say, I said, that you really didn't expect to find these? Of course not. I'll admit I came up here deliberately because I've heard certain rumors. Something to do with a dream? No, nothing to do with a dream, and I'm as surprised as you are to see these books. These two I've seen before in expurgated editions. But this I've never seen before, although I've heard vaguely of it. He looked fondly at a third book he held, and I could see that his eyes were aglow with a sort of wild anticipation. I reached for the tome, and he relinquished it almost reluctantly. It was huge, heavy, and the pages were brittle and brown. There was no title on the spine or cover, but on the first page I read in a delicate, faded script, Monstries and their kindy. Each word was in script capital letters, free of each other. No author was mentioned. I placed the book on my knees and saw that the edges of the leather binding were well-worn, frayed in places. As I turned a few pages at random, a powdery brown dust blew out and lodged in my nose. I sneezed. Hey, be careful how you handle that. Bruce took the volume back solicitously as a mother with her child. I took one more look around the room, sniffed the air distastefully, and said, I'm getting sleepy. Good night. I don't think he even heard me. When I left him there, to cross the hall into my own room, he was sitting hunched over the table by the oil lamp, opening monstres and their kindy tenderly, peering down into it. The next morning I was downstairs early, only to be informed by Mrs. Corey that Bruce had preceded me. He had eaten hastily and said he was going down the road to see Lyle Wilson. She pronounced the name distastefully, and I could see that she didn't like the old man. I didn't blame her. I waved breakfast, my only concern being to get out of this morbid town as soon as possible. I was doomed to disappointment, however. Upon reaching Lyle Wilson's store, I saw that Bruce and the old man had been talking in what appeared to be a mutual earnestness, if not eagerness. I came up in time to hear the latter say, I'm certainly glad you intend to stick around a mite. Ain't many outside uns hankers to do that. I've heard more nor one o' him calculators how the sunshine, and the land, and all are round here be sorta unhealthy like. He stopped a moment when I came up, then went on with renewed eagerness as if he didn't often have such an audience. And leave me tell ye suthin, young sirs, they may be right. There be sartin things I could tell about the cause o' it, too, things sec as ye'd never believe. But mark ye this, they be more in this world nor meets the eye, and they be other things besides them as walks on top the ground. He looked from one to the other of us, grinning, and I moved back a pace to avoid his obnoxious breath, but Bruce, to my surprise, said, You mean things such as, and he pronounced a word that I wouldn't even attempt. Lyle Wilson's eyes popped out in amazement. He looked at Bruce with a sudden startled suspicion. I read about it, Bruce hurried to explain, in a book called Monstres and their Kinde. 
He regarded the old man carefully to see the effect his words would have. The effect was one of relief. Oh, that book. It aren't much. Belonged to old Hans Zickler, Ab Cory's grandfather. He Thet built the house. But I know. I got a better book than Thet. He chuckled in a way that sent a cold chill up my spine. He paused and peered at Bruce as though waiting for him to exhibit some curiosity, but Bruce wisely did not. I'll tell ye anyway. I got old Zick's diary. It be Cory. He used to have it. But real sudden one day he told me as he wore going to burn it. I reckon as how he had been redden into it. I asked E. B. fur it. And I guess he wore mourn glad to give me it as payment for some things he wore Owen. Said he didn't care what become owe it. Sept in as he wouldn't have it in his house no longer. Now I could see Bruce's curiosity surge up, and his voice bordered almost on excitement. You say you still have this diary? Yep. Reckon I be the only person that's ever seed into it, sept in Eb Corey herself, and I don't think he read much o' it. He thought, Twar only the old man's crazy ravens. Wilson's voice became confidential. D no, I'm kinda glad you fellas dropped by. Folk here about wouldn't listen to me. A cause they be scared to. That's what. They be scared o' what I could tell em about or Zickler, and and certain things I seed, im do. Things that, that weren't just right. But sometimes when I gets to pondering, and remembering, and redden in the diary agin, thur comes a kind of hankering like, and I want to try. So's I kin know them things too, like old Zick did. And sometimes the hankering gets too strong like, he stopped suddenly, as though afraid he would go too far, and a wild light died slowly out of his eyes. Oh, course, he went on more calmly. I wore jest a young un then, when I spied on old Zick, but I remembers right enough. And even EF the land do be gittin' better every year, and things around here ain't so bad as they used to be, they still southern about and active once it in a while. Look at the young Munro boy, he as they claim wandered off and fell down in the ravine, but I knows a heap better. E.F. He fell down the ravine. Why didn't they ever find the body? He moved his stool closer to Bruce, leered at him, and repeated almost defiantly, Eh? Why didn't they ever find the body? The old man chuckled delightedly at the sensation he had made. I was becoming considerably annoyed at all this crazy gibberish. I told Bruce I was going back to the house. He nodded absently. As I left, he hunched forward, listening intently, as Lyle Wilson started on another wild trend. At noon, Bruce showed up for lunch, seemingly preoccupied and puzzled about something. I wondered what further stories he had succeeded in getting out of Lyle Wilson. I suddenly remembered, too, something I had intended to ask Bruce, but had forgotten. So, half facetiously, I asked, Well, did you dream last night? Eb Corey, who had come in from the fields, looked at me curiously but not angrily. Mrs. Corey, however, shot me a look that made me wish I hadn't asked the question. Nevertheless, we all awaited Bruce's answer, she most anxiously of all. Yes, he said, I did, and that's peculiar because I usually never dream. Maybe it was because I was up pretty late reading in those books. At the mention of the books, Mrs. Corey looked at Bruce quickly, quizzically. Oh, Bruce said. I'm sorry if I wasn't supposed to look at them, but you see I'm interested in that kind of law. It's all right. Please go on. Sure, I reminded him. What about the dream? But I suppose you don't remember it. Most people don't. But I do. It was just a fragment of a dream, really, but too vivid for me to forget. It seemed that I was walking somewhere in a sort of mist, down a narrow dirt road. There was a rusty wire fence to my right, and I came to a gap in it. Automatically I turned and passed through it, and walked down a path behind a large house. Bruce turned to me and smiled, as though he were reciting a fairy story to a child. All this while, mind you, something was drawing me. I wasn't walking of my own volition. I knew I should make an effort to run back, but at the same time, paradoxically, 
I seemed very anxious to get to whatever was drawing me. Well, the path was tangled with coarse grass and weeds, and suddenly I saw where I was walking, in a graveyard. All around me were tombstones, but not stones really, for most of them were ancient name boards of wood, inclining at all angles and overgrown with weeds and brambles. Then, right before me, I saw a low cement tomb. It was cracked and moss-covered, but the wooden door was still solid, and the huge iron hinges, though rusty, were still intact. I stood a moment before that door. Now I felt a very strong attraction, almost an affinity, to, to whatever lay beyond. I don't doubt that I would have entered. In fact, I was just about to. But at that moment I awoke. I was lying on my cot upstairs, and a cool breeze was coming in the window at my head. I closed the window and went back to sleep, but I didn't dream any more. I glanced at Mrs. Corey. She had sat there taut and silent as Bruce talked. Now she was biting her lips as though to keep from screaming, but the scream showed in her eyes. She rose in sudden agitation and left the room. Her husband continued eating for a moment in silence. Then he looked up, unperturbed, and said, Martha's easy upset. But maybe there's good reason. You see, she had a sister that slept in that room once, and she dreamed that same dream, and then she just disappeared. No trace ever found of her. Before that, it was the Monroe boy. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yes, Lyle Wilson was telling me about the Monroe boy's disappearance, said Bruce. Do you know anything about it? Nothing except he was playing out in the fields near the ravine, and he disappeared. We searched, but no trace of him. Then, it must have been all of a week later, his younger brother came running home and said he'd seen Willie's face with a lot of others. His face... Bruce sat bolt upright. Is that what he said? Yep, that's all he could say. He'd seen his brother's face with a lot of others. Said he'd been playing down in the ravine. But he didn't know just where. Bruce looked at me, and he wasn't smiling now. Corey seemed to take everything stoically. Of course, he went on. It used to be horses and cattle that disappeared. No trace. This all happened some few years ago. The land was pretty bad then, too, but hasn't been so bad since. Not till just recent. What do you think of all this, Eby? Eby Corey looked at Bruce stolidly. Mr. Tarleton, you're a scientific man. I'm just trying to make a living here off of land that... That ain't right somehow. You said that books like them upstairs is a kind of hobby of yours. Then you ought to know more about all of this than I do. I looked into one of them books once. Just once. I can say this. I didn't understand much of it, but I know such studying won't bring you to no good end. But that's your affair. Me. I just try not to think too much about it. That's the longest speech I ever heard Ebe Corey make, and it seemed definite enough. Bruce apparently thought so too, for he said, I think I'll come out there a little later this afternoon and take a look at your soil. Wish you would, Mr. Tarleton. Wish you would. You'll find me down on the south end. I had listened to all this in silence, but something was bothering me, almost haunting me. I couldn't get it out of my mind. Bruce's dream. I arose from the table and left them there, still talking, and went upstairs, wondering just what it was about that dream that bothered me. The path across the old graveyard. The ancient tomb. Something drawing him on. On a sudden impulse I entered that room where Bruce had slept. A faded green blind was still drawn over the single window. I raised the blind. Even before I looked, I knew. Then I looked and saw. The scene swept across my brain like a dash of icy water. As I stood there momentarily paralyzed, I felt the first hint of the cosmic horror that was soon to engulf both Bruce and myself, and come near to blasting my mind. There was the narrow dirt road to the left. There was the rusty wire fence, the broken gap. There was the grass-tangled path and the fallen tombstones in the ancient graveyard just behind this house. And there was the cracked cement tomb, just as Bruce had described it from his dream, only a short distance away from this window. A few hours later, as we walked across the fields, 
I told Bruce what I had discovered, the graveyard behind the house, and the exact parallel to his dream. He wasn't surprised, said he'd seen it too. I suppose you're beginning to think that what I experienced wasn't a dream at all, that I actually walked down that path toward the tomb. Well, you're wrong. It was nothing but a dream. I know I never left my room. He seemed for a moment about to tell me more, then changed his mind. But I was, by now, very curious, not with the avidity of a student of the ancient Loris such as Bruce displayed, but with a certain skepticism. Did Lyle Wilson tell you any more stories? What about that diary? I know you were dying to see it. I saw it, but not enough of it. He brought it out and read me certain parts. Remember his saying he had a certain hankering sometimes? Well, I told him I often had a sort of hankering too. Then he brought out the diary. A hankering for what in heaven's name? I don't know, but I'm afraid it isn't in heaven's name. Whatever he was talking about, that's what I wanted to find out. And did you? Very little. I got too curious, I guess, and Lyle got suspicious. Still, he read me quite a few passages from that diary of Hans Zickler's, and I'm beginning to piece things together. Remember Corey saying his grandfather built this house and added the back wing later? Well, that's right. Maybe you noticed the wing brings that room pretty close to the edge of the graveyard. What about the diary? I insisted. Well, I learned this much. Old Zickler used to sit at the window of that upstairs back room in the late evenings and mumble a kind of gibberish. That window's easily visible from the road. Neighbors passing by soon got the idea that Zickler was crazy. Lyle Wilson says that he was just a young man then, but he remembers seeing old Zick sitting there, could hear him too, and he was certainly a wild sight. Well, it seems that there was something in that tomb, and Zickler suggested that it had answered him, but in a strange way. Not audibly, but mentally. A sort of unearthly telepathy, I guess. Old Zick couldn't explain it quite right. All I can gather is that it was teaching Zickler something, and that occasionally it thanked him for something. I'd certainly like to read more in that part of the diary, but old Lyle is too shrewd. Along about that time, a lot of livestock was disappearing, and a few children. It seems that Zickler had them all carefully recorded, but it's hard to place any of these circumstances consecutively. As Lyle read to me, he kept skipping about in the diary haphazardly, looking up every once in a while to see what impression it made. There was one place where Zickler hinted at being dissatisfied and restless and wanting to learn more, but to do that he would have to look up a certain passage in the Necronomicon. He mentioned saving his money so he could take a trip over to Arkham to look into the copy of the Necronomicon it is rumoured they have hidden away in the Miskatonic University there. But evidently he never did make the trip. At least, there's no mention of it, and Lyle tells me that Zick never left Vecra. Died a natural death here, though he was mumbling bizarre things on his deathbed. We walked on to the south field, where we found E.B. Corey busily ploughing. He stopped for a while and watched Bruce poking around in the ground at various spots. I'll bet you never saw any soil like that before, Eeb said grimly as Bruce straightened up with a sample. You'd win that bet, all right. Look at this stuff, will you? And Bruce handed a clod to me. It was the most peculiar-looking soil I had ever seen, a queer grayish color, almost powdery, though it wasn't dry, more like slightly damp ashes. It seemed tainted somehow, and evil, even felt tainted to the touch, not like fresh clean earth should. I dropped it, repressing a shudder, and wiped my fingers clean. Bruce looked at E.B. in amazement. Do you mean to say that things grow in this? Oh, sure. Taint near so bad down on this end as it is closer to the house. Closer to the old graveyard, you mean? Eb looked at Bruce, then shrugged. Well, same thing. Not as bad as it was in my grandfather's day, either. Only thing is, stuff don't quite get to normal size somehow, and often as not, I raise some things that are might, well, queer, distorted-like. But it all seems eatable enough. I wonder what your grandfather thought about this land. He must have had some idea about it. 
Eeb shrugged again, no telling what Grandfather Zikla thought, especially in his last years. He was half crazy then, everybody knew that. All I can say is he was drove to it, or drove himself to it. I remember him saying once that the land didn't belong to us know how, and the way he said it, he didn't mean just this little piece of land. He meant all the land everywhere, I guess. It give me the creeps the way he used to talk. Said something about we was here just temporary like, and some day they would wake and claim the land that was rightfully theirs. He used to mention they sort of reverent like. There was an awakened light of interest in Bruce's eyes as he tried to press this point. He didn't say how or when this was to happen. He didn't mention certain names such as Loigo or Bemoth or Ftaka. But Ebi didn't seem to remember. Old Zickler had spoken too many queer words. Bruce put a sample of that evil soil in an envelope, and before we left he asked one more question. Eb, do you remember Lyle Wilson taking a trip to Arkham fairly recently? Maybe he said something about visiting the Miskatonic University Library? Nope. Eeb shook his head. Then he seemed to remember something. Maybe you mean that time a little more than a year ago. Wilson made a trip then, was gone two or three days, but he never breathed a word to anybody where he'd been. Thanks. Bruce seemed deeply immersed in thought. Corey resumed his ploughing, and Bruce and I cut across a field toward the ravine. It was quite steep where we reached it, full of small trees and scrub bushes. In the direction of the house, however, a quarter of a mile away, it shallowed into a little gully that ended by the edge of the old graveyard. Bruce looked intently down into the ravine for a moment, then turned away. What did you mean by those names you asked, Corey? I said, as we walked back to the house. And what do they mean? Lord knows I won't attempt to pronounce them the way you did. And I laughed. Bruce didn't laugh. What do they mean? He repeated. His voice was different than I had ever heard it. I had come almost to believe that they meant nothing, that they were only names. But now, my God, I'm beginning to believe again. Seems eatable enough. I wonder what your grandfather thought about this land. He must have had some idea about it. Eeb shrugged again. No telling what Grandfather Zickler thought, especially in his last years. He was half crazy then? Everybody knew that. All I can say is, he was drove to it. Or drove himself to it. I remember him saying once that the land didn't belong to us know how. And the way he said it, he didn't mean just this little piece of land. He meant all the land everywhere, I guess. It give me the creeps the way he used to talk. Said something about we was here just temporary, like, and some day they would wake and claim the land that was rightfully theirs. He used to mention they sort of reverent like. There was an awakened light of interest in Bruce's eyes as he tried to press this point. He didn't say how or when this was to happen. He didn't mention certain names such as Loigo or B. Moth or Ftaka. But E.B. didn't seem to remember. Old Zickler had spoken too many queer words. Bruce put a sample of that evil soil in an envelope, and before we left he asked one more question. Eb, do you remember Lyle Wilson taking a trip to Arkham fairly recently? Maybe he said something about visiting the Miskatonic University Library? Nope. Eeb shook his head. Then he seemed to remember something. Maybe you mean that time a little more than a year ago. Wilson made a trip then, was gone two or three days, but he never breathed a word to anybody where he'd been. Thanks. Bruce seemed deeply immersed in thought. Corey resumed his ploughing, and Bruce and I cut across a field toward the ravine. It was quite steep where we reached it, full of small trees and scrub bushes. In the direction of the house, however, a quarter of a mile away, it shallowed into a little gully that ended by the edge of the old graveyard. Bruce looked intently down into the ravine for a moment, then turned away. What did you mean by those names you asked, Corey? I said, as we walked back to the house. And what do they mean? Lord knows I won't attempt to pronounce them the way you did. And I laughed. Bruce didn't laugh. What do they mean? He repeated. His voice was different than I had ever heard it. I had come almost to believe that they meant nothing, that they were only names. 
But now, my God, I am beginning to believe again. Do there really exist embodiments of those names? Perhaps old Zickler knew, and others from time to time. After all, those names and the rumours and the books do persist through the years, and where there is legend there is a basis of fact, if only it could be traced back through the eons. That was all I got from Bruce, but he didn't need to tell me more. For a long time I had been aware disinterestedly of his study of ancient lawyers. I knew he had in his library a certain shelf of old books, besides scores of fiction pieces on the subject. I had read a few of the fiction pieces and was amused. Deep in my mind was the safe and comfortable knowledge that they were fiction and nothing more, but now I wasn't so sure, and I didn't feel so safe. Perhaps all that fiction, after all, had been based on, on something I didn't like to think of. My vague perturbation was enhanced by the way Bruce had said those words. But now, my God, I'm beginning to believe again. Just how much Bruce believed, I don't know. Nor what he was trying to learn, nor why he left his room that night. I doubt now if I could have acted in any way to stop him, even if I had known. The one fact I see clearly now is that neither of us then realized how slowly and insidiously everything was building up to that tragic climax. That night after supper, Bruce went upstairs to his room, intending, he said, to look more carefully into those ancient books. I stepped outdoors to smoke my pipe. Somehow I always enjoy it more outdoors, and at night. It helps me to think, and that's what I needed to do. In a muddled sort of way I was trying to decide how much of this ancient law business I dared, and how much I feared, to believe. I only knew that I liked this place less and less, and if Bruce didn't want to leave in the morning I would take the car myself. Finding I was nearly out of tobacco, I walked down to Lyle Wilson's store. The place was dark, I stepped onto the porch and was about to try the door, thinking perhaps he hadn't locked up yet, but then I decided he must be in bed, and I had better wait until morning. I stepped off the porch and was almost out to the road again, when I heard his front door open, I turned and was about to call out to him, when something stopped me. It may have been partly intuition, but mainly it was Lyle's actions. I could see him only dimly, and apparently he did not see me at all. But the way he closed his door ever so softly, and crept furtively across the porch, interested me. He disappeared around the corner of his store, and I followed. He passed through a gate at the rear of his property, crossed a field, climbed a low fence into another field. I stayed a safe distance behind him, just keeping him in sight. I could barely make out something that he carried under his arm, apparently a thick book, undoubtedly the diary that both he and Bruce seemed so interested in. I soon saw that he was heading for the ravine. Undoubtedly he had travelled this route before, because he seemed very sure of his direction and seemed to be heading for a certain point. I lost him in the dark for a moment, hurried forward, bumped into the low-hanging branches of a tree and scratched my face. When I reached the ravine he had disappeared entirely, but I could hear him faintly as he climbed down some path nearby. I searched for a few minutes. Finally finding it, I descended. Rather, I skidded, rolled and tumbled down that steep path in the dark, arriving at the bottom by the simple expedient of plunging head first the last five feet. I arose and brushed off my clothes. By that time, Lyle Wilson had disappeared entirely. I couldn't hear a sound, couldn't even guess which direction he'd taken, and if the night were dark before, it was positively Stygian at the bottom of this ravine. As disgruntled as I was puzzled, I tried to climb back up the path, but I couldn't. I stood there for a minute, nursing my bruises and cursing myself for a fool. Then I remembered that the ravine became shallower until it led out by the edge of the graveyard a quarter of a mile away. The only thing to do was to follow it in that direction. After all, I decided, I might come upon Wilson again. But I didn't see him. Once I stopped, thinking I heard the sound of metal striking on metal, but I didn't hear it again. I proceeded in the dark, avoiding small clumps of bushes and trees as best I could. It wasn't until I was almost at the graveyard that I remembered. Suddenly, disturbingly, 
something E.B. Corey had said, about the youngest Munro boy who had been playing in the ravine and had run home to tell his mother he'd seen his lost brother's face with a lot of others. At the thought of it, I hurried my steps. I cut across a corner of the graveyard to the house. Looking up at the window of the rear room, I saw no light there. Thinking Bruce must be asleep, I went around the house, entered the front door a bit breathlessly, and hurried upstairs. I had intended to waken Bruce if necessary, to tell him of Lyle Wilson's nocturnal excursion, for it might mean something to him. I pushed open the door and entered his room, and moved through the darkness to the table and the dimly seen oil lamp. I searched in my pocket for a match, while with the other hand I fumbled for the lamp. Damn! My searching fingers had found the lamp all right, and I had burned them on the still hot glass chimney. Bruce must have turned it off no more than a few minutes before. I finally managed to light it again, and as the shadows flickered about the room, I saw that Bruce wasn't there at all, nor had his bed been slept in. Perhaps he had stepped out for a breath of air. On the table one of the heavy tomes lay open, which I recognized as monstrous and their kindy. Beside it was a soft leaded pencil. Then I noticed that Bruce apparently had been checking certain passages with the pencil, very lightly on the crisp yellowish pages. I decided to wait for him, so drew up a chair and began to read those passages which Bruce had so painstakingly marked. Now, after twelve years, I cannot precisely remember those excerpts, but I do know they were in a quaint old English spelling, and the first paragraph to strike my eye was almost as follows. These be not manifest, but they do wait in patience for a time that why is not yet. Of a hideous potency be ye blackness wherein they dwell, for they do not always sleep. They be remote one from another. Nonetheless they do have a devious intercourse. Beneath that far north, in ye ancient times eclept Hyperborea, do they wait. Afar in ye east, beneath vast plateaus, they be rumoured. In ye new dark lands across ye seas they surely be. Men of ye sea have whispered of unspeakable manifestations on strange islands. Indeed there be fearful rumour of ye fate of men who go down with doomed ships. These creatures be nameless, but assuredly must they be spawned of ancient Bimoth and Phtaka, Loiga and Cathorn and ye others. In silence do they await ye call of those elder ones. I stopped reading there, aware that this all sounded vaguely familiar. I must have read similar things in other old books of Bruce's. I turned a few pages to see if he had checked other passages. He had. Some mortals there do be who revere them, and some few also whom they instruct in a certain wise. One of these was ye Iborn of that ancient Hyperborea, and there have been others. Suddenly startled, I remembered old Zickler sitting at that very window talking a sort of gibberish to something in the tomb which he hinted had answered him. Now I read on, suddenly eager, seeking out those passages which Bruce had marked. There be divers' ways mostly forgot, in which they may be awakened. And it why yes then that they become restless and impatient for ye time, and provoke their powers. One of ye ways, as set ye down by Aborn in his book, doth follow. Here there was only the beginning of a long incantation of indistinguishable words. Most of it had faded away, as though from constant reference to this page. As I thought again of old Zickler sitting mumbling at this window, my interest surpassed all previous bounds. I turned back a few pages to where Bruce had first begun marking. So evil they be, that ye land a wike under they lie doth become strangely polluted, and ye very soil doth crawl, and strangely be ye thinges wike grow thereon. Alhazed in his chronicle hath avowed, that whomsoever be attracted unto them, by ye nefarious influence which they project when invoked, doth remain forever a part of them, not dead, but new and oddly bodied, instructing ye very ground, and adding to ye power of them. Also hath Alhazard said, Evil ye mindy wych wis held by no heady, and die wis ye ground wych. 
For the moment I stopped reading there, and my eyes skipped over to the next page where Bruce seemed to have underlined several of the statements, as if they were of the utmost importance. I read that passage carefully. But some there be amongst them, white wait restless and impatient for ye time. Tis said these few do inherit ye elder power to attract unto them small animals, then ye cattle and small children, then ye weak and ye sicker, then whichever men who sleep close to them, upon ye whom they do project a kind of dream. Tis also said, that whomsoever be thusly attracted unto them, doth become a part of them, that wise to say, ye all in one white ye elder ones await, and doth instruct ye creatures and ye very ground in which they be. In these wise, when ye time doth come, shall they enjoy ye ultimate consummation. Thusly shall they inherit ye lande again, which once was theirs. That is as much as I read. I remembered old Zickler's statement about the earth not belonging to us. I remembered Mrs. Corey's vague hintings of people who had slept in this room and who had dreamed and then disappeared. I remembered Bruce's dream the previous night of the graveyard and the tomb behind this house. For perhaps five minutes I sat there in the flickering lamplight, remembering these and other things. Suddenly I leaped to my feet, shuddering, an icy cold wave of horror sweeping over me. Here I had been sitting waiting for Bruce to come back. In that moment I knew what I must do. I went leaping down the stairway out into the dark night and around to the side of the house where we had left the car. The forty-five automatic that Bruce usually carried in the glove compartment was gone. So was the flashlight. Anyway, it made no difference now. I found another flashlight in my kit. The batteries were very weak, but I was thankful for it. I went through the gap in the fence and down that path behind the house toward the tomb. I remembered Bruce's description of his dream, wherein something had drawn him here against his will. Nothing was drawing me. Of that I was certain. How true is the saying, fools rush in. Not until I was standing right before the tomb did I see that Bruce had indeed been there. The heavy plank door was pulled slightly ajar, making a little arc in the dirt. The iron chain which had held it was now broken. It was a tight squeeze, since the door would open no further, but I finally managed to enter. Flashing my light around, I saw a few mouldering wooden coffins at one side. I scarcely glanced at them. Instead, I examined the cement walls that were damp and musty. Then I gave a start of surprise. Without quite knowing what I was looking for, I had found it. At the rear of the tomb I saw a roughly rectangular hole in the cement. Quickly, I crossed to it. I flashed my light into a passage that led slightly downward for about ten feet, then seemed to level off. Determined now to go where Bruce had gone, I bent low and squeezed into the passage. At the bottom of the slight incline, I again flashed my light ahead. Then my heart pounded in excitement and amazement. The passage was narrow but high enough for a man to stand erect, and it extended far beyond the feeble beam of my flashlight. I moved slowly ahead. Soon I began to distinguish what seemed to be other smaller passages branching off, but what struck me so forcibly was that this main passage seemed to extend straight toward the ravine. There was a stagnant, loathsome stench that seemed to roll over me in tangible waves. I touched the earth walls and recoiled, it was the same dampish, greyish kind of soil Bruce had examined, but much worse. It was slimy. It seemed to crawl under my touch as though it were alive. I came near then to giving up and going back. But, gritting my teeth, I went on. My foot struck something hard. I bent, fumbled, and picked it up. It was Bruce's automatic. It still felt faintly warm. I knew it had been fired. Now there was no more doubt only a vague fear and foreboding. I stood there in that noisome passage, holding the gun that had been fired, wondering what I should do next. It was decided for me. Just then I heard the sound. Quickly I snapped off the flashlight and stood there in the dark, tense and listening. My heart pounded blood into my ears, so that I could hardly hear the sound when it came again. 
but I heard it all right, faint and far away, not close as I had first thought. The sound was a voice, a blurred and mumbled voice that seemed to chant, and the chant was a thing obscene and alien for all its vagueness. Of that much I was sure. Quite still I stood and listened, and still the sound came, faintly from far away down that passage toward the ravine. It seemed jubilant and joyous, now uttering paeans of praise, now again descending to a garbled undertone of obscene implications that made my flesh crawl, despite that I could distinguish none of the words. I knew, as I stood there listening to that loathsome ritual, that there were things I should piece together, something to do with Lyle Wilson, but somehow I couldn't remember any more. My thoughts were becoming jumbled and uncertain. Not daring to use the flashlight, I moved warily forward a few more paces. Bruce, I called softly, and listened, then a bit louder. Bruce, can you hear me? You must be in here. Then, oh God, then I heard a sound that was not the chanting, a sound much closer just ahead of me. I stopped and listened and didn't breathe. Something a few yards away was moving toward me in the darkness. Bruce, is that you? I called again. And suddenly I knew those were not footsteps nor anything resembling footsteps, nor anything I had ever heard before. I never used to have nightmares. I never used to feel an awful fear of an enclosed room. I never used to wake in the middle of the night with a dread of a monstrous unclean thing coming toward me out of the dark, so that I must fumble frantically for the light cord and lie sweating afterwards and fear to sleep again. I wish I had never clicked on my flashlight, there in that passage behind the tomb. Something stopped there, half revealed at the end of my pale beam of light. I know only that it wasn't human. I fired the gun and I didn't miss. There were only three bullets left, and I remember hearing every one of them hit with a soggy, sucking sound like pebbles thrown into thick mud. It could not have been more than ten seconds, but it was ten eternities. I suddenly knew that it did not fear the light, but was only momentarily confused. And then, it came just a little nearer into the beam of light, and stood fully revealed. I didn't hear myself scream, but I know I must have, for my throat was raw afterward. I felt my mind slipping slowly away into a chaos of vertiginous horror. I knew it was I that moved, and I must have screamed again. Yes, it was I who moved steadily, slowly closer, and I could not help myself. I knew I must move closer still. Until. Until what? I never knew. For at that moment, strangely, I seemed touched with a surging wave of coolness that beat down my rising panic. It no longer seemed I that moved. It was another part of me. A part that had been eons ago, that was trying now to go back to the soft, safe warmth of the primordial. It was the kind of ecstatic feeling I'd had as a child, when I squeezed thick black mud between my hands. But this was magnified a thousandfold, cosy and dreamy and logical. And yet there was something wrong, vaguely disturbing. There was another I, unimportant and far away somewhere, but persistently imploring, imploring me not to succumb, not to go back, to remember. Remember what? That tiny faraway me was so pitifully amusing, as it tried with a feeble sort of intensity to burst the surrounding comfortable darkness. It was trying to tell me. Something to do with. A dream? Was that it? Seemingly eons ago I remembered a dream a friend had told Memmi, of something irresistibly de-drawing. An affinity. How swiftly did comprehension flee back to me then, through a newly rising panic, as I remembered. How quickly I was back in that passage again as the ancient part of me and the present part of me merged with a frantic rush. And I saw. Then it was that I screamed for the third and final time, an articulate scream. Bruce! I was very near now to that thing that was drawing me, and I saw it quite clearly. But with that last articulate scream, something about me abruptly shivered, wavered, and I felt a sudden surge of power. I could feel something trying to help me tear my mind away, something softly, subtly, urgently aiding me, something whispering, do not come. 
Do not move. Go back. Now. Quickly. And that urging was the greatest horror of all, for I knew Bruce was there. By what supreme effort I did tear my eyes and mind away, I shall never know. I do not remember it. I only remember the frantic escape up that last ten feet of slope, of something surging soundlessly behind, something that touched my ankle as I squeezed through the broken rectangle into the tomb, and the awful sodden sound of it hitting, seconds too late, with a sort of squish like a heavy wet sponge against a W wall. There remained one more thing to be done. Out of the tomb I fled, across the graveyard, and into the ravine. I knew now what I was searching for, and I found it despite the darkness. I found it, well concealed in a little gully behind masses of bush and vine, the other end of that passage. I saw the iron-barred gate across the tiny entrance, probably placed there by Lyle Wilson himself. It now stood open with a snap-lock hanging from it. Just inside the gate I could dimly see Lyle Wilson, a crouching figure, wrapped and listening. He had heard my revolver shots, he had heard my screams, and then silence. Now he began another of those low chants that gradually rose in volume to a jubilant paean of praise. I could not have remembered the words even if I had wanted to. They were hardly even articulate words. I saw him accompany it with an unholy little ritual and dance that ordinarily would have sickened me to the soul, but already I was beyond that. He didn't hear or see me until I had leaped forward to swing that gate shut upon him and snap the lock. The most horrible part of it was that his chant didn't even stop as he rushed at me clawing with a whitish sort of foam around his mouth. He crashed into the gate, tugged furiously at it, and then his chant turned into a sickening gurgle of terror as he quite suddenly realized what was going to happen. He sank down just within the tunnel, groveling in stark fear. I think his mind snapped, for soon his cries reverted again to an incoherent gibberish, like the memory of a horrible language long dead. I waited there until I was very sure I heard, coming swiftly nearer down the tunnel, that surging primordial horror. I have destroyed, of course, the book which Bruce was reading on that last night, and I myself may someday forget most of those excerpts at which I glanced, but never the one which read, Whomsoever be attracted unto them, by ye nefarious influence which they project when invoked, doth remain forever a part of them, not dead, but new and oddly bodied, instructing ye very grounds. I have said it was ten seconds that were ten eternities there in the darkness of that passage, but my mind was numbed then. It is the horrible remembering later. If there be gods, I pray to them to set my brain at rest and as surely as there be things of evil, I pray to them to let me forget, but neither prayer is answered, so I must still remember that writhing, surging thing of iridescent evil, all shapes and yet shapeless, that primal quasi-amorphous thing that moved as worms moved that sightless mass, not complete of itself, but with the power to draw men to it. That much I could forget, that much would not make me dream, or wake up screaming with an awful fear of the dark. But those dim faces that peered from out of it, that were now eternally part of it, still horribly alive and wide-eyed with the terrible anguish of knowing, those human faces that could not speak, could only implore in silent agony that I destroy them, and this thing that should not be, those distorted faces enmeshed and enfolded in the confluent parts of that blasphemous thing, those faces among which I saw, dimly but surely, that of my friend, Bruce Tarleton. End of Horror at Vecra by Henry Hasse This is the end of the story. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Please subscribe and ring the notification bell so you'll be the first to know when we release new content. If you want to support us, consider joining our channel membership. You will get instant early access to more than a hundred stories before their release. This is the only way to support our channel.